Was your first try at writing it before you went to Lebanon? I, um, the, the idea of going back to Lebanon was connected to my attempt to write about it then. So I um, was a university student in the years after my discharge. I was studying Middle Eastern studies in large part because of my experience in, in Lebanon. I did a course on, on Lebanon. And I was trying to write down what I remembered from the army, sensing, I think, that if I didn't write it down quickly, I was going to forget it. And it became clear to me that what I needed to do was, was go back. And I thought that I would be kind of closing a circle and marking the end of, of this strange little war that had left me with a feeling of, of disquiet as it had for many of the people who participated in it. So I went back to Lebanon around that time. This was the fall of 2002. And my attempt to put it all together uh, in, in a manuscript happened at about that time. And, and as I said, it was it was unsuccessful, I think, both because I wasn't a very good writer, I, I hadn't um, amassed any, any journalism experience, and because I didn't understand why anyone should care about this other than me. You and your friends, yes. Okay, yeah. uh, well, I, I see like three levels of importance in your own life, uh, and then the national story of Israel, and the international piece that w you were just talking about, the precursor to I Iraq and Afghanistan. Which one of those uh, moves you the most now? For to me, the most eye-opening part, but I don't know about personal feeling, was the changes in Israel, in Israeli society. Right. I, I still think that for me, the most moving um, part of the story is what happened to, to my friends and to people I know at this, at this outpost, simply because it was such a pivotal moment in our lives and it left uh, such, a, such a deep impression on me and on the other, on the other guys who were there. Um, in fact, just half an hour ago before we started taping this interview, I got a call from a friend of mine who I haven't spoken to in years, a guy who was also at The Pumpkin, who happened to pick up a copy of the book in Hebrew, which just came out a week ago. And he was very emotional about it. And, and he hadn't thought about these experiences for years. And for me, a lot of what I wanted to do with writing this book was that, was to speak to myself and to the people who were there, who were there with me. And for me, that's still the most powerful part of the, of the book. But it certainly has the other two, the other two, um, it, sorry for me. it certainly has the other two levels that you, that you mentioned. I think I saw something important um, globally, a shift in the way war is fought, a shift in, in world events. And I think I saw a very interesting progression in, in the state of Israel and the move of this place from, from one kind of place to, to another kind of place. And, um, kind of a maybe an, an eclipse of a kind of utopian optimism that existed in the country. The idea that peace was uh, was on the horizon, that we were on the brink of, of of peace, and that this conflict was going to end. That's what I thought when I came to Israel in 1995. That's what I thought was happening. And by the time Israel pulls out of Lebanon in, in 2000, and the peace process collapses, people here understand that something very different is going on in the Middle East. And and of course, anyone looking at the Middle East over the past you know five, ten years understands that that the region has not um, has not panned out in the way we imagined that it would in in the 90s so the story of the pumpkin ends up being a, an interesting way of tracing all of those changes yeah well now you have what i saw one critic call the uh, evolution of the between bombardments israeli they just carry on yeah. you know just carry on because nothing's ever going to get particularly better I think there's something to that. I mean, I think in the 90s um, and, and before, many people in Israel believed that, okay, there might be one more war, but then it would end. And, and then we'd see a normalization of Israel's place in the region and we'd see peace. In the 90s, people really thought that peace was, was a real possibility. And uh, Israelis don't really think that way anymore. And Israel in many ways today reminds me of, of the pumpkin. And I write this in the book that at the pumpkin, we had this kind of bubble um, this concrete bubble, and in, in, in the bubble, we could watch videos and have a good time, and you know, um, things weren't too bad. But it was a concrete outpost on on a hilltop, and it was ringed by trenches and sentries and and machine guns, and we were constantly on on guard. And there's something in the country today that evokes the outpost, um, although it's. It should be said that for me, most, most things evoke the outpost. So <laughs> it's a pretty subjective uh, observation. But I, but I do think there's something to it. Right. And um, there was no 
turning up of prospective peace partners when you traveled through Lebanon? There wasn't any that's Christmas right. truce. That's, time, that's right. I mean, I, um, I think at the time in 2002, I, I, I still thought that I would go to Lebanon and find reasons for, for hope. Um, and I, I didn't quite find that. I mean, I had a, a wonderful visit to Lebanon, and I certainly um, discovered the shared humanity of the people on the other side of, of the border. It just turns out that humanity isn't all good. And when you discover the, sh- <laughs> you know, the shared humanity um, comes with a lot of um, um, reasons for pessimism as well as, as optimism. And I came back from Lebanon um, not necessarily hopeful that, that uh, the conflict was about to be solved. I think if you um, grew up in a place like Canada, which I did until age 17, you, you tend to think that conflicts are a misunderstanding, that if people could just know each other better, then there wouldn't be conflict between them. I think that's a pretty standard Western belief. And I think I still had dregs of it in 2002, even though I'd been through the military and I'd seen all kinds of things. Um, but, but I think that's not true. And I think people here actually understand each other quite well. And I think that there are real gaps between, between them. And I came back from Lebanon having spoken to many, many people um, with, a, with an appreciation of, of, of their position and appreciation that you know, there are people just like me, but without any um, illusions about this very deep and very old conflict being a misunderstanding that would be sorted out by a few face-to-face meetings. I, I think I was kind of inspired by stories like the Christmas truce of 1914, right, when the British and German soldiers um, kind of unilaterally declare a ceasefire on Christmas and they come out of their trenches and play soccer with each other in no man's land. So if you take that template and apply it to other places, you think that it's just a matter of getting out of your trench. Well, they got it out, out that way. until their commanders ordered them back to man the gun. So it's, didn't that's extend right. to that's Boxing right. Day. That's, how, that's right. That's how that truce fam- famously ended. Um, the commanders got wind of what was going on and uh, ordered the war to resume. <laughs> Enough of this fraternization, gentlemen. Uh, you also remind me when, when you said uh, that you'd run into a pumpkin uh, companion who had just seen your book in Hebrew, what a small world you literally and metaphorically live in. Uh, one of the striking lines in your book was, um, I can't remember his name, but the head of Hezbollah waving the uh, Israeli rifle. And you said, he got, he got that from a guy I run into in, in Israel now, in yeah. Jerusalem every now and again. So, yeah. I mean, you knew the soldier who lost yeah. that rifle. That's right. That's right. I mean, this is a very small country, and it's a very intimate country, and, uh, and this is a very intimate conflict in, in many ways. It's a very small number of people involved, and we all live very close to each other. Um, that's true of the people on, on both sides um, in themselves, and, and with each other, there's a lot of contact here. So uh, I think that is kind of unexpected. It's certainly not something that an American soldier would expect to find, but somehow it, uh, it didn't surprise me that the rifle that was featured in all of these propaganda posters in Beirut, I happened to know that it was a rifle that belonged to a guy who I, who I know and who I still meet around Jerusalem sometimes. Right, what does the uh, future look like to you in the Middle East? Is it essentially a more of the same? Well, Yes, I mean, anyone who predicts the future here is certain to look like an idiot uh, within a matter of weeks. I mean, I don't think any, any of us could have predicted a year or two ago, um, for example, that the Russians would be uh, our new neighbors, just a few hours drive from where I'm sitting right now, the, the Russian military in Syria. And I don't think anyone could have seen you know, four or five years ago the extent of the collapse of, of the Middle East. I mean, Syria was more or less a... Um, you know, a stable country five or six years ago, and today there are half a million people dead in Syria and more people displaced in Syria than are still in their homes. Um, it's not, uh, I guess I'll go back to the, um, um, uh, um, you know, um, it's not like the old days where an empire could could step in, where the British could, you know, could step in, or the French, or or the Americans, or the Ottomans. There are no empires anymore, and all of the power structures in this region have have collapsed or are on the brink of collapse. So I don't think anyone should expect this to be sorted out quickly. It's probably a, you know, a thirty years war type uh, thing, if not if not longer. I think we might still be just at the beginning 
of it, as terrible as that is to say.